Greg Eplerwood, South Union Street, and uh, a couple of uh, uh, things. Uh, first, I just saw that the DPW is uh, uh, announcing a session on, I think, the 18th of September regarding a uh, public hearing regarding uh, changing the reducing the speed limit in the downtown core from 25 to 20 miles an hour. And I just want to mention that, um, you know, I mentioned this in an earlier meeting that uh, South Union Street, even though it's 25 miles an hour, I often, when I'm walking the dog in the morning, see uh, cars in that almost quarter of a mile between Howard and Spruce, uh, probably double that uh, speed, close to 50 miles an hour. And they're going so fast, I can't even get the license plate number. And so uh, if, if, you know, I'm more concerned about enforcement uh, than the speed limit uh, issues. So anyway, that's one. Uh, the second is that uh, I'm ward clerk, ward six clerk, and November 5th is the uh, general election. And um, I think we're going to have enough workers. they are going to put out an email uh, later this month uh, looking for workers and lining people up. But what I'd like to see is, for the first time in many years, a bake sale going on at Edmonds Auditorium in the gym. Um, everybody asks me, where's the bake sale every election? And I say, I don't know. I, <laughs> I have no idea. I don't bake the cookies. <laughs> So uh, if anyone uh, watching or here in the room knows anybody who uh, PTO maybe handles the bake sale, uh, let's have one this year. Thanks. Can I ask you a follow up on it? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's uh, maybe for the arts program or the little mini theater program, I understand. Mm -hmm. Plays that they hold, yeah, it usually is. It's PTO raises money. It's usually, it, it, from what I remember, it's always been somebody from the PTO, but I'm not absolutely sure. Hey, Greg, Alan might be able to connect to the right person. Okay. Uh, hello, Nick Anderson from Champlain College. Um, Welcome. Uh, you're actually probably the first event to be in this newly renovated space. Just spent all summer um, creating this new addition out front and sprucing up all the classrooms. Um, but just want to give you a heads up that obviously the fastest way out of the building is straight out that door um, in the event of emergency. And then if you want to use bathrooms, uh, take a right and then a right. Uh, there's a couple of single use bathrooms on, on this other end of the uh, addition. So welcome by saying thank you again for hosting uh, and moving around our rooms we grow because we were previously in a small but beautiful room. Um, as um, Greg said there's there's several meetings going on over the next few days and I just wanted to make sure to call the, them out to everybody um, these are both on the front porch forum calendar and on um, the city calendar. Uh, this Sunday, uh, several of the representatives are hosting a Zoom cafe uh, with a climate and environment update. Um, next Wednesday, um, CEDO is hosting a memorial block open house. Um, that's at five o'clock, Fletcher Free Library. Um, I should have mentioned the um, Climate and Environment Update is Zoom only. And um, the next Thursday uh, is the Public Forum on Community Safety, and that's at 5.30 in City Hall. Dylan? Yeah, hi, I'm Megan Hepler-Wood, and uh, I am just reminded, of course, of our community safety and security problems. and. Today, uh, the Seven Days did an update that I wasn't aware of, that COTS is going to be the organization that the city will rely on to set up our winter shelter over for the, all the homeless or unhoused people that are living in our community, which is, I think, a good breakthrough. I mean, they have to still apply for the federal funding, but it, it, it's promising. But the very same time that I was reading that, I got it email from COTS fundraising uh, because, of course, they have so much experience with handling unhoused people. And I just want to remind everyone of what a crisis we're in, and that's one way to help.
until recently, the city council would be able to seat on stand. Person who's we firmly opposed to that position and love to see it getting. And so we've got the rest of the year to work on it. If somebody's got anything to know, extensive remarks, community development, and city council next week, explain. Position is we should be here as us. And do the things that we need to talk So, right now, so in the past, about 15, 10, 15 years ago, the professional person with professional level skills and community agreements that helped the MPAs the improvement on this and all the MPA staying with the HLM, the city wide, the events, etc. And that was terminated just before the pandemic. And ever since then, the MPAs have struggled. So I'd like to see the MPAs get back to the state where they were. So that's the short group you can see. It's an example of Supporter of me, others are I'm not going to read through all this and actually I'm going to speed right through this presentation because what I think is important is I give all of you an opportunity to ask questions and for us to have a little bit of a discussion. Um, so basically, Plan BTV Walk Bike Action Plan is not a rework. We're not looking at the plan and starting from scratch. It's a necessity to do this every five years in order to be eligible for federal grant dollars. It shows the government that we're still committed to the plan. It also is an opportunity for us to look at data, what we've done, what we want to do, what our next steps are. And we, we do know what we've done. Um, Local Motion was uh, kind enough to go through all of our projects and kind of look at well, what are some things that we've done? What are some things that we want to do? Um, and then also some community engagement. So our first public meeting will be at Con Toys Auditorium on October 21st at 6 p.m. Um, I will send this presentation to the MPA group, whoever's in charge, I guess it's you. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then you can distribute this and folks can take the survey, um, all of that good stuff. Um, the other thing we're here to talk about is the change in speed limit. Um, so in the state of Vermont, it is allowed to, in a designated downtown district, to have a speed limit less than 25 miles per hour. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. And why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because it's based on previous plans. The 2011 transportation plan recommended that we do this. It was something that the public works we attempted to do back in 2013, I believe, and it wasn't passed. The citywide 25 mile per hour speed limit did, but the 20 mile per hour downtown district change did not. And so now we're proceeding with it. A bunch of other information in here as to why we want to do this. Pause for a question. I'm not going to take questions. I'm going to get through the presentation and then we'll totally take questions. I'm happy to do that. Um, so I have a bunch of other graphics in the presentation that give you an idea as to why we're doing this, why what's going on. I'm like two slides ahead. Am I still there we go. too fast for your own stomach? I'm so fast. Um, what plans it's based on other than the 2011 transportation plan is also based on plan ETV walk bike, um, which recommends this uh, 20 mile per hour slow zone downtown core. You can resolve this later. 
Um, other graphics, why it makes sense, uh, pedestrian fatality, uh, field of vision, and uh, also stopping distance versus speed. That's another important component to this. So some challenges in terms of how we are gonna go about engaging with this. If you think about uh, St. Paul Street before we did St. Paul Great Streets, it was wide, it was long, it was straight. It invited people to go fast. After St. Paul was transformed using Great Street standards, speeds dropped exponentially. So you think about um, design, effective street design can really drive compliance and behavior. I understand your comments, sir, about enforcement. I can't comment on that. I'm not in the police department. And I'll leave that to the police department to comment on enforcement. But what I can do as an engineer is tell you that we try to achieve design speeds by effective lane width and curb radius and different painting materials and traffic calming features that invite people and tell people this is a slower area of town. Streets are narrower. Main Street's going through that treatment. Main Street is designed to be a 20 mile per hour street. As we go through street reconstruction projects, the downtown core, Bank and Cherry, that's going to be one that's going to get 20 mile per hour um, uh, engineering design standards. Um, now, I know that we get the, uh, we've been getting the question, well, why can't we go less than 20 miles per hour? Well, we don't have to really investigate it. We can look at other communities that have, there's not really a benefit of going less than 20 miles per hour. It's a marginal benefit at, at best. And there's some major design limitations. So there's not like a major uh, benefit overall in going that direction. Um, you know, also we wanna get deliveries to uh, businesses. We still have logistics to consider. So 20 miles per hour seems like the right uh, feel for, for that. And we can always go slower later on down the line. What is the timeline? As gentlemen mentioned already, we are going to the Public Works Commission next Wednesday for final approval. Um, we've gone to all sorts of meetings and talked about this a bunch. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is traffic calming, which I know folks are super interested in. We have a slug of 56 requests, 25 are qualified. We have three different traffic calming projects that are underway in different phases of um, progress. Um, we understand that folks, want us to proceed, we are limited on funds, we are short on staffing, these projects are very time consuming, but we have engaged in some low cost strategic uh, solutions. Um, the one that we're attempting right now is some rubber speed humps. If you've been down Grove Street, Elmwood, or if you've been up in the New North End and driven down Goss, um, we're using these rubber speed humps, which are um, fairly inexpensive. If you compare, say, the South Prospect Street Asphalt speed humps that we installed last year, each one of those costs between thirty and forty thousand dollars. All of these rubber speed humps that we put in at three different locations cost a little under seventeen thousand. And so, we're not rolling it out all over the city. What we're doing is we are collecting data. We pick three different streets: one being an arterial, kind of a major thoroughfare, a collector which collects. Um, volume traffic from arterials and get some to low volume streets and then a low volume street. So we're collecting speed data, we're collecting noise data to see are these effective, is this a good solution, and we're collecting noise data as well. We're finding that the noise can be a bit of an issue on Grove Street. It's an arterial, there's a lot of contractor traffic. So we're already kind of getting a picture on where these will work and where they won't. We're also gonna look at other possibilities, um, temporary curb extensions, things like that. You can peruse all this information later if you like. And that is pretty much it. So now I want you to engage with you and take your questions. I hope I didn't, wasn't too rude over there. Pick up the iPhone and tell me that I was rude or anything. Sure. Not rude at all. I get the idea of wanting to say your piece first. Um, so, uh, you were talking about the downtown speed limit. And you said we tried to do this in 2013, but it I didn't. Think it was pass. And so, my question was who who's the decision maker for this? The Public Works Commission. So, who was proposing it? Uh, DPW staff. 
I wasn't okay. hearing, so I'm not sure why they didn't pass. Um, I think, to be honest with you, and looking at some of the transcripts and some of the notes, I think, uh, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but I think DPW staff, technical services staff, kind of talked the commission out of it during the meeting. Um, and I was like, why did we do that? <laughs> I'm not sure why we did that. Um, so, but, you know, we're coming back around and, and we're going to proceed with, uh, with this work. And so if those of us who like this idea, what role can we play and how can we play? I mean, you can send emails to me or we also have the W planning uh, email address. You can show up at the commission meeting next week and speak during public forum or you can speak during the deliberative agenda when I present um, the speed limit change. So certainly. Thank you. That was great. Greg? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah um, I think I can make a pretty good case and lead traffic on South Union. So what are the, uh, you know, how does that process, how do we get qualified and seriously looked at? What kind of things would be good to point out? So South Union Street is not in the downtown, designated downtown district. Yeah, so, I understand. Right. And, and and so you're talking about engaging in some traffic calming. Exactly. Right. And so I don't know if we have that in queue as a traffic request. Or I, I, well, Union. not that I know of. So send me, send me an email. That's what I would say. Let's start with that. But what, what kind of information would you like? Uh, well, what, what, what's, what, what, what is compelling to the commission to staff? Well, it's not, it's not about compelling to the commission. We let the data tell the story, right? What data would you like? Well, <laughs> what data is we collected? Okay. And so, and we may already have it. I, I could probably look it up now and waste everybody's time on it, but hand handedly trying to find well, it. Well, there are some things that isn't, that you can't qualify as data, for example, it's heavily uh, Edmond School. There's a lot of those school yeah. kids walking down yeah. the sidewalk. I don't know if that's data, but I would like to add that into the yeah. mix. Yeah, right. So Union Street is what I would call, um, it's not an arterial, it's, it's definitely a heavy collector. Um, and what we would do in that case, you send me an email, I get together with Julia Urzaki, who's my public works engineer, and we work together. And I say, what do we got for data? What, what's, what do we have that exists? on Union Street. And then we look at it, and what we're looking at typically is what's called the 85th percentile speed. I'm sure we have traffic counts, and the 85th percentile speed is like the best gauge of actual driving conditions. Of course, occasionally, there's gonna be someone that speeds. I mean, that's just, people do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And if that's what the data shows, then we can go, all right, what's, what kind of traffic calming can we get into? These these uh, projects are very expensive. How is it measured? If those cables are required? So ATR. Cost, I have seen those. We ones. also, so the, um, the speed counting devices that you'll see hanging on different streets, those collect data as well. Um, it's not quite as accurate, but it does collect speed data, um, and it's data that we have on hand, and that's something that we can look at as well. Um, if you reach out to me and I get in touch with um, our traffic foreman, Scott Phillips, and say, hey, can we put a speed counting device on South Union Street at this location? And yeah, just reach out to me and we'll get you headed in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah. You have to get involved in that as well. Um, sure. You mentioned so there's uh, qualified. Are there, are there, did it, is that listed anywhere in terms of what makes it qualify, or is it just sort of internal yeah. benchmarks? Um, so there's some internal benchmarks, and that's a really good question. Um, so projects are usually picked by several different processes. Sometimes it has to do with opportunity, right? So if we know that there's a paving project, for instance, it's happening on North Avenue right now. And so because that's happening, when we have a contractor, and it would be very inexpensive for us to use that contractor to do some restriping for us, to eliminate a right turn lane, which is something that we're looking at as a possibility, um, we're going to take advantage of that situation because there's an opportunity. Um, but then we also have data, like I said, speed data, right? And crash data. So that kind of information is going to let us know. So like East Ave, pretty high speeds. We knew that that's a traffic calming project that was needed. Birchcliff Parkway, high speeds, it's a cut through. 
um, folks were really using that as, um, I mean, the neighborhood was screaming for some good traffic calming, and that was a really good project. I recommend you drive down Birchwood Parkway um, and see the raised crosswalks that we put in um, successful project. Locust Street, not as successful. Those raised intersections um, were not built quite the way that we wanted them to, um, but we learned from those situations. So uh, yeah, priorities, crashes, speed, um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd be, I'd be curious to look right into the once we submit that, what, what the process looks like, you know, for that. It's, to get it. it's not a situation where you're in queue and you're like, oh, you're the 56th person in line, you're going to wait, you're, no. What we do is we collect data and we look at what's the most serious speeding condition, mm -hmm. right? What What is, where are we having all these crashes occur? What, and, and what are some, what's some low hanging fruit solutions that we can engage in? Like, for instance, on North Street, we're, taking parking in front of Sustainability Academy and we're moving it from the north side of the street to the south side of the street. That creates a parking chicane. Um, so cars will have to adjust. And also cars that are dropping kids off will be on the side of the street next to Sustainability Academy. We've had some pedestrian crashes. We had an elementary school student that was struck at the Rose Street crosswalk there, okay. Um, and um, so what are some low hanging fruit options that we can engage in beyond putting up the curb, putting up asphalt um, speed humps, which is tremendously expensive. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Joel Rackenheimer on South Wanusi. Okay. Two years ago, there was a sign up that had uh, South Wanusi as a no truck approval. That sign has disappeared, and we now have many heavy trucks, semis, rolling down Winooski, and you have bicycles on both, bicycle right. traffic on both sides. I think that's why you guys made that a no um, truck through. Is what that going to go? Happened? <laughs> yeah, what happened? That's a great question. You send me an email, I will, because I, I can't take notes right now, so it will be super helpful for me. Is if you send me a message later and I'm going to uh, hook up with Caleb Mann, who's our associate engineer, he kind of monitors that kind of thing and see, because there are trucking routes and <coughs> I don't know if South Winooski is or isn't. I think it is. St. Paul Street is, because it's, yeah. um, and then I know Prospect is, because it's an alternate state route, but, so but we can, we can check that out. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is your department, but has the city ever considered having days, occasional days where downtown traffic or other up downtown or other areas, streets are closed for the cars? We just we talked about it, definitely. I know that um, we, we have a couple, or more than a couple, a few city councilors that are extremely interested in um, extending the Church Street Marketplace area and to other areas of, of, of the city. And, um, you know, it's it's definitely in conversation. The, the, that would be great. Um, but I was just thinking of just, you know, temporarily. People, I know in other cities they've done it. Philadelphia, they've done that. Um, you can do it. You can declare an event on your street mm -hmm. with the police department and you can close your street. You know, there's there's permits involved, mm -hmm. and there's other things that we can do. If you wanted to do something like that, um, do what's called a demonstration project. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm happy to share a truckload <laughs> of information about demonstration projects, community-led demonstration projects, which I would give you the information, but there would be a lot of staff scaffolding if that was something that you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, um, I think Burlington a few years ago had uh, what in Latin America is called Ciclo Dia, where streets are closed to bicycles yep. on Sundays. Do you recall that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, it's the name of the Open Streets or something else. Yeah, yeah it, it was. But Nancy, is that what you were uh, yeah. talking about? Um, yeah, yeah, the bicycles for all those states. Or, yeah, there are events like that. Um, we used to have um, uh, Open Streets, I think is the name of the event. And like the pandemic, pandemic ruined everything. 
Um, so, um, and, and Burlington Walk Bike Council meets once a month and we have conversations like that. Um, there's a small group of people um, in order to like get things accomplished that they would be more than happy to have folks show up. Um, we meet every first Wednesday of the month at DPW in the front conference room and um, in October, the mayor will be there. Um, so that could be something that you bring up there. Um, you could get a lot of interest from Rones and Walk by Council um, members. Uh, any other questions, Charles? <clears throat> so, uh, so again, Charlie, the board too. So you had a slide up earlier, picture up earlier of the uh, curved curve. Uh, let's see. Yep, oh, that's it right there. You know, oh, yeah. black one. And so, yeah, I'm curious because I know you're definitely collecting data on those. Sure. But I'm a little surprised what you're learning because if any vehicle goes over those more than five miles an hour, they damage their vehicle. Wow. And yet you're collecting information. Yeah. And they're only like what? They're definitely less than 100 feet apart. So um, no, no, they're they're more than 100 feet apart. Yeah. So the, the sweet spot's about 120 feet. Okay. And we do that because that you don't want to give folks an opportunity to accelerate. So, but you also don't want them to be too close because then it loses effectiveness. So like 120 to 150 feet, that doesn't allow anyone to really step on the gas and accelerate. I'm just curious because you're almost closing the street. So everybody goes some, so the traffic on, on that part of Elmwood, I guarantee you is down probably very close to 90%. Because people you mean the volume, the volume itself? Yes. Well, the beauty of that is that we're collecting volume data as well. Yeah. So we already have speed and volume data on Elmwood without the speed humps. So now we'll be able to look at the speed and volume data after and during the installation and let the data tell the story. This is the volume down. Like that is something that we would look at. Because yeah. it's true. I mean, the reality is, is that um, you know, you get situations like on Stanford Road where there's speed uh, bumps there, speed humps on Stanford. So people will take Shore Road and manage the gas and then take a right onto uh, Stanbury and then hit the gas and then take a left to get into the Apple, you know, the Apple Tree Point neighborhood. Because yeah, you're right. Like the the people that speed, they're oh, oh we don't go to a board or speed on. I don't like them. So I'm yeah. Out. yeah, I'm just curious because, like as I said, it, it almost closes the street. So like I'm patient and I I go over all three of them, mm -hmm. but a lot of other people are not going to be that patient and they're going to go somewhere else. So I'm just yeah. curious what you're actually learning when you shut the street down. I don't know about it. I, I don't know. I can tell you that on Grove Street, um, the volumes have not gone down. I mean, it's a it's an arterial. People need to get through. Um, and speed data looks great. It looks fantastic. Yeah. The issue is the noise. So the noise data is definitely, and mainly it's because of the contractors, uh, not the trucks, but they're what they're towing behind, the trailers. And when the trailers go over the speed humps, it makes a very loud bang. And, you know, you know, I, I met with the gentleman at his house and we watched it for a while. He's like, I sleep right there. And it wakes me up at 5 a.m. every day. Okay, so. And so next year you're gonna move in somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think we're learning that, you know, that, that location, you know, it, data tells the story. So it's giving us some information as far as what we can use and where, and and we're interested in using other uh, cost-effective products as well, like um, uh, temporary curb extensions, right? So something like uh, that you can bolt to the ground that would be a, a temporary curb extension, which visually narrows the road. Um, so yeah, we're working on all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure almost everyone I've spoken to are very happy that they're there to some extent. So people are being patient, and they're obviously portable because. Yep. You're basically drilled into the, the asphalt. They are. They are. And then we chose this product in particular because it has a 15-year warranty. <laughs> so if they get destroyed at all, they, at least that's what the company says, um, you know, we we just, we mail them back and we, we get new ones. 15-year warranty. That's good. We can notice have sensors for impact as well as sound. So what we do, so the sound is, uh, I take an intern and I, I can download an app. <laughs> but we have an app on, on our iPad on the sidewalk and they collect uh, desiccated you know, sound. Wow. So it's, it's yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
and they they do it for uh, well. And they're getting paid for that. Good. <laughs> but then we also have the ATRs, which are the tubes, and we also have a radar on the ATR as well. And the CCRPC um, has been a major support in our work as well. And so they have ATRs and uh, so forth. Right. Um, you mentioned noise. Um, but then it's you know, you are right about that, um, but I would say that um, I wasn't going to say that to the gentleman that I met with. He lives right next to one of the students in the bedroom, right there, and yes, the guy and the guys come to do it. They're a truck trailer, you want to walk back. The decibel level from the sidewalk is around there. That's pretty high. Yes, sir. Oh, good. But we talked about the service like that. Yes. And cars in the places that um so we designed so we haven't put any temporary um curb extensions in yet. Um, but that definitely would be a major consideration. Uh, but our permanent curb extensions and, and other we, we designed for bicyclists. And usually the, the interactions are good. I mean, we don't, we don't, there's not a ton of crash data. There's really not much crash data when it comes to bicyclists and cars. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a question. 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 I have a Arrow right in the road. Yeah. So I'm just curious what the thing is about 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 the thing you know, I think vice, I mean, I'm a bicyclist too. And when I have traveled that four um, besides that, for sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, well, thank you very much, Phil, for coming yeah, and, uh, yeah. and sharing all this information with us. And I uh, hope that you all come to the uh, October 21st meeting for Plan B TV Walk Bike Action Plan, or at least take the survey, and I will send um, the uh, presentation to you as a PDF. That'd be great. Thank so you. Can see it. Yeah, I'll say, and on that point, actually, we've been, as a steering committee, we've been discussing, or we have discussed in the past, different opportunities to send follow-up information from our meetings. Uh, so it's something that, that we will dig into more. And but again, I mean, we've raised some time, but if anybody has any ideas or recommendations or requests, I uh, would be happy to talk about that because I do think there is a lot of outcomes and questions. And obviously, if we get answers back, we'd like to share that out with the whole group. And we're always interested in uh, the uh, the public information manager, Robert Goulden, and I are, are talking about mm -hmm. some creative ways to communicate better with the community because sometimes it's like we're in our ivory tower and folks want to know what's going on. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Um, Eleanor, thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm inviting up uh, Eleanor Walker from Department of Public Works uh, Water Resources. Hi, I'm Amelia McClure. I work for the Wastewater and Stormwater Program. Thanks so much. Actually, if you want to oh, um, you introduce yourself again to the mic so folks don't like to hear you. But... See you guys later. Sure. Like me to share your quote? Yes, please. Yes. 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 And we are here to talk about stormwater and water quality issues, which I think was a fall from our June meeting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last time I was um, in May, we talked about other uh, water quality things, which was around the uh, service line inventory. And then I just happened to be here while I you guys gave a, a presentation about green stormwater infrastructure and 
saw that there was interest in sort of having a follow-up and just trying to sort of use uh, the NPA as sort of a tool to see, you know, how you guys can get more involved in helping improve and protect the water quality. Thank you, Thank you very much. We appreciate you both being here. Actually, would you mind introducing yourself again? Yeah, um, so my name is Amelia McClure. I live in Ward 3. Um, and um, yeah, I work for the City of Brentwood and Water Resources um, in the Stormwater Program. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so yeah, so I'm here to sort of talk about our, our, water, our approach to water quality, which we like to refer to as one water. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to sort of start off with like sort of why we consider, you know, why we talk about one water. And so that's the integrated water cycle. And essentially, you know, the, the point of this graphic is a single drop of water goes through the entire uh, cycle. So, you know, you start with a water supply at the bottom left. In my case, that would be Lake Champlain. Then you sort of, you know, it gets the, so the water treatment plant through our distribution system. You know, we, um, it goes to homes as well as uh, businesses. And then from there, it becomes wastewater. And it goes into the wastewater treatment plant. And then it sort of comes out um, as treated water. And also there's stormwater when uh, it rains, and then that also ends up in the in the water supply as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this tells you that typically in terms of stormwater, there are two different types of structures. So the one on the left is called a MS4, or Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. As its name would imply, the pipes for stormwater and sort of the pipes for you know the sanitary sewer are completely separate there. So that is on the left. I, I hope you can see it. I think you can. Yeah. Um you can if you can. Yeah. Um so you can see that the orange is the sanitary sewer. It goes sort of straight to the wastewater treatment plant. And then the MS4 goes sort of straight to the, the river or the, the water supply here. On the right, we have a combined system. And so what happens is essentially that the sewer, the sewer pipes as well as stormwater runoff pipes, they share the same pipes. So you can see that they sort of get mixed up together. And when it doesn't rain, right, everything goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And that's called also we call it in dry weather. And in wet weather, when it rains a lot, uh, then you can have an overflow. And so then a mixture of the stormwater runoff and uh, the and the sewer will go into the water supply. In Burlington, we do have both types of these structures. Um, next slide, please. I just, if you want, don't mind zooming into that one, I liked that graphic better to show you that there is sort of a, a structure that that wear wall on the left there uh, in dry weather in, in the pipe is what sort of blocks it from going to the water supply you know, during dry, dry weather or even with small storms. And what happens during large storms, then it'll go over that wall and go um, into the, the water supply. Next slide, please. So this is, if you could also zoom into that one. This is the best map I could find. I I, I was, could have sworn that we had a more readable <laughs> map somewhere. North, uh, south, middle. <laughs> well, so this is all Burlington. So you'll see, it's sort of a little, a little down, I guess, was in large place. Um, but so those little dots are, the out, are all the outfalls. You will see some red lines, um, especially sort of at the, the top of the map. Those are your straight, like separate sewer lines. Uh, the, then you have the storm lines that are, they look yellow, but they should be green. But um, those are sort of those, so those parts of the city are MS4 separate storm sewer systems. And then the purple, are sort of areas of the city um, that are in this combined 
system. Yes. Yeah. So, I ask very quickly. Absolutely. The green or yellow, whatever they are, if they're if oh. they're separate. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I don't know anything about audio. Um, <laughs> the yellow or the green, if, if those are the separate systems, is that what you're saying? Uh, where where do they go? Are there pipes that somehow that we don't see that go down to the um, to the uh, sewer? Yeah, I'll show you a picture of something like that later in the presentation. Oh, okay. Okay, so actually, let me ask a question. So we've been doing water and sewer upgrades over the years. Mm -hmm. So are we having less and less of one type of system and more and more of another? Is that what's happening? We will get to that possibly on the next slide. I think okay. we, but we are we are getting to that. Well, in a couple slides. <clears throat> um, but so some of our, our main water quality concerns, specifically in Lake Champlain, are is phosphorus, uh, which comes from both wastewater and stormwater, as but also we get you know, sort of all the uh, the, pho the phosphorus from all the agricultural runoff. From sort of back east and it all sort of gets uh towards lake champlain phosphorus is an issue because it creates the uh, cyanobacteria so the blue green algae which we then have to close the beach another important uh, water quality concern um, is erosion and sediment and that um that when sort of streams get eroded there's more sediment and then they also contribute to poor water quality and uh, the, these blooms and then the combined sewer overflows, as you might imagine, um, having some sewage in the lake is not great. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, we are in the city subject to several different permits and requirements from both federal and state agencies. Um, so we have an MS4 permit through the state, and that sort of tells us, um, like, what, you know, sort of both actually both plants, both MS4 and wastewater sort of tells us how much phosphorus and stuff like that we are allowed to discharge into the lake. We're also subject to uh, total daily maximum loads, um, and that is um, on the EPA side, and that is, so that's from the Clean Water Act, um, and essentially the Clean Water Act um, identifies water bodies that are classified as impaired for one reason or another. Um, so, some, so some parts of Lake Champlain as well as Angles, Anglesby and Potash Brooks, not the only Brooks, are um, considered, they are classified as impaired primarily for phosphorus, um, sediment, and also I should have written better notes, I believe, I think it. Yeah, there's an impairment for, it's called just stormwater. Yeah. But it's sort of like the overall like flashiness yes. of the stream. So we're looking usually for a stream with like some base flow that then increases during wet weather, but our like these Englesby and Potash brooks have basically no flow during dry weather and then have extreme like surges during wet weather. So the EPA is like hoping will address that as well. Yeah, and those are bad for erosion purposes. And then I, I figure which one of these two days are, are also impaired for chloride, uh, which is a small other separate issue. <laughs> Next slide, please. And then, you know, one of the sort of the, the context, right, that we are, are working in currently is so we are, we have aging infrastructure. Uh, so we'll talk, I think, in, in the next slide. We, we did do a lot of wastewater treatment plants up, upgrades in 1994. Those are, you know, about 30 years old now, which are, which means that we are typically at the end of life of uh, the, the treatment plants. Which is concerning because you know these are critical infrastructure for us, and so we are going to be um, they're start as they sort of near that end of life term. Things you know it's squeaky; they don't really work as well. Sometimes uh, they can even break down. Um, higher costs, you know, COVID, everything costs a lot more now to do anything, and also um, I'll talk about it in a little bit. But we are moving away from the combined sewer system. Um, and the way that you do that is that you, you have to like go in and physically separate uh, the system, which is very expensive to do and also very difficult to do because it's very disruptive. So we have sort of have already disconnected everything that we could without a huge, huge heading. Not that it was easy to disconnect in the first place, but we sort of, we, we did all the low and lower hanging fruit. Like now it's really the tippy top of the trees uh, that's left. Um, 
So that's a little difficult. Excuse me, the clarification. Mm -hmm. um, that map, does that show the amount of upgrades that have happened so far? Does that show? No, that's current. That right, so that's what I'm asking. So everything that has been upgraded is on the map? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, other things that impact uh, water quality are increased development, and this impacts both wastewater and stormwater. Uh, wastewater, because as you have more people, there's just simply going to be higher flows of wastewater, and especially as we, you know, have um, businesses or businesses grow, such as like breweries or anything like that, um, they have what's called high strength waste uh, that sort of make the wastewater plants work harder. And obviously, we have climate change. Uh, you know, with uh, rain rainstorms happening more frequently, and also um, they're becoming more flashy, uh, which means that our system is less equipped to to handle them. That's sort of what we're dealing with. Next slide, please. Uh, so that is typically that's sort of uh, that's Burlington Water Resources, and that's sort of everything that we do. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we do all sort of the, the treatment of lake water for, for drinking water. We deliver that water. We also do a fire protection, also very important in the city. Water quality protection is sort of, you know, both in the drinking water, the wastewater, and the storm water. Um, you know, wastewater, so it does all of the treatment. So basically, you know, those are, we have you, water resources is drinking water, okay, water, wastewater, and storm water. And when we talk about warm water, we talk about integrated water resources and integrated planning. And essentially what that means is we're looking at all of our requirements together as a whole and seeing how each of these three aspects can work together uh, to meet those requirements. So some of the efforts um, that have been done in the past. So, I mentioned that in 1994, we did uh, big upgrades to our wastewater treatment plan. Before that, uh, you know, Burlington was discharging like an annual average of about 170 million of untreated and non disinfected combined dwellings to Burlington Bay. Um, I think now the number in like a really horrible year, I think, might have exploded. So it's a lot better. Um, and after uh, that work was completed, so now we now have five untreated combined sewer overflow locations down to each flow. Um, and we now have a CSO treatment system at main plant, um, and then we're also at main plant doing biological phosphorus removal, which is a better treatment of phosphorus. So that combined flow, because when it does typically go through main plant, now we're treating, we're doing, we have better treatment for phosphorus there now. And so this uh, this slide just sort of shows you the, the frequency of the uh, CSOs and also which how many CSOs we have versus some of the projects uh, that we've done to address it. Um, we will see, so this goes from 2005 to 2022, there is, that first of all, like, 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 found like it was identified as being 10, so that's why I wasn't there beforehand. And then Pine Street CSO, which is currently the, the most frequent uh building party in the better way to say that is we identified it in 2015. So what's interesting is so what I like about this um little graph is that so that yellow star is one of the projects that we completed to um to disconnect Been to address these CSO concerns. 
Um, one is we're talking about our falls, like are there hidden pipes, places that um, discharge water to the lake or to the river? And the answer is yes. I didn't start seeing them until I worked for the city and now I see them everywhere I go. Um, so we um, took basically, you can imagine like a, a storm drain and instead of connecting it to the um, uh, sewer pipe, we then moved it to connecting to an existing outfall where this is creating outfalls. Um, this, like in some cases, is quite easy, as Eleanor said, low hanging fruit, but in other cases, um, for instance, in the Maple Street area, we'd have to dig up all of Maple Street and replace the pipe with the larger pipe to separate that, that storm sewer. And then the second strategy we undertaken is the installation of green stormwater infrastructure. So I know you guys are really interested in that in this board. And so green stormwater infrastructure uses plants and landscaping to capture stormwater and then infiltrate it into the ground so it can be used um, in the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, uh, rather than like running off into directly into a water body. So next next slide. And so um, we're in Ward 6, so I thought I would take a minute to show and tell you guys a little bit about some of the green stormwater infrastructure in Ward 6. Um, this is up on um, like the Prospect Parkway neighborhood, so like Fairmont, Holt Streets. And in that neighborhood, we have five different infiltration basins. So what that looks like, um, you can see sort of the above ground infrastructure on the right hand side. There's a little um, storm drain, we call it a catch basin, like sort of on the corner of that um, curb right there. And so that captures like a certain amount of the water uh, that's flowing on the street and then sends it underground. And this is a picture that was taken during installation of the infiltration system. And it sends that water to the like yellow, like corrugated. Um, chamber basically, um, which sits underground and can fill up with water and then hold it as it slowly in, uh, infiltrates into the ground. And so, yeah, if you guys are, if anyone lives in that neighborhood or wants to take a little field trip, it's really nice to walk around. We have um, like native pollinator plants planted above those green and plants. Um, so that was a really nice project that we did in Ward 6 that did help alleviate some of um, the combined zero overflow flow coming from Ward 6. So yeah, we can go to the next one. So now that we're sort of have talked a little bit about what we have done in the past, I think we're going to move on to talking about what we're hoping to do in the future. And so the two sort of main categories of this work is tackling aging infrastructure. And then secondly is prioritizing and incentivizing green stormwater infrastructure around the city both public and private. So we can go to the next slide. So this slide is, um, I would say, extremely important to me. I spent four years working at the main wastewater treatment plant. And so I really saw firsthand our city's aging infrastructure. Um, in the past, we've um, requested money um, as like a city bond um, to do uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. There was one that happened when I was there that was really cool to watch that dealt with um, the final step of the wastewater treatment process that um, sterilizes water before it gets discharged into Lake Champlain. And that, like, I really can't say, like, how much it impacted like, um, the staff that works there and also, uh, like, helps protect lake health. Um, so we're, yeah, so grateful we could do that project. Um, we're currently in the planning process. We do have the funding for a um, treatment plant upgrade that um, will um, address and improve the failing uh, infrastructure that makes up the first step of the wastewater treatment plan process. So that the uh, those equipment pieces uh, remove um, trash, leaves, sand, dirt, grit, eggshells, coffee grinds, like all the sort of like um, stuff that will like settle out of wastewater um, so that it doesn't um, cause harm to the equipment downstream. So. Those are the two parts of the project that has been paid for by um, money that the bond, um, that the voters approved in a bond. And so, um, yet there is still more to do. <laughs> so there's the whole sort of middle section of the wastewater treatment process that we um, are also planning on um, upgrading as we deal with this aging infrastructure. And so, we'll be um, back to talk about. Yeah. That. <laughs> so in, in a month. Or yeah. So. <laughs> 
like just just uh, putting it out there for now. So um, we're looking for upgrades that um, treat more phosphorus re required by the state and the federal government to treat us uh, to remove a certain amount of phosphorus from the wastewater. And so we'll be installing these like fuzzy filters um, that will filter out the smallest particles of phosphorus from the wastewater. Um, and like we also never want to be the ones that say no, the city can't. Um, build housing or support a business that it wants to support. So we do also need to accommodate, um, grow our treatment capacity so we can accommodate future community growth. Um, so a little shout out there at the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Um, you can come take a tour of the wastewater plant. I really encourage people to do that if they haven't seen it before. Yeah. How do we sign up for that? Um, you can show up. I can give you a link to the tour on the 27th, which is um, 24th is, is the, oh, okay, the 24th, um, which is the one that um, Jill and I are hosting together through, um, it's a combination Lake Champlain Sea Grant and um, Burlington the, uh, Public Works Department. Um, the tour that's focused more on like the CSO component of the treatment process. Um, so we can give you a link for that. And then the other ones, do they have a sign up link or? Not yet. Yeah. And also, um, I think they'll, they'll all be at 6 p.m. So you can just show up. <laughs> so is it tonight? Yeah. Time the yeah. Know. Five, I think they're at 5.30. Yeah. 5.30. 5.30. Yeah. So you can, you can tell your friends. Yeah. And we will put, post them on social media. I'm not realizing that. I don't think there is one at 9.27. I don't know why I put that there. Um, I'm sorry. My I have a baby. I don't really sleep. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But yeah. So next Thursday and the following Tuesday. So those are our first two. Um, and so I think we're really looking for people to come. To yeah. That. Um, and sort of that way you can, you know, we can sort of take stock of the questions and, you know, yeah. improve the tour or go chase down some, yeah. some information. And really, like, I think we're all part of this ecosystem of like the Lake Champlain Basin. And I think this is a really, um, like important way that we do impact with, uh, we do interact with our ecosystem. So I think the more we can all know about our relationship with the planet that supports us, the better. And this is yeah, just one way to learn about that. It's also a really good time to take <laughs> uh, the tour of my plant. I took it when it was unbearably hot. <laughs> and that is a less good time. It's true. We should, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a nice breeze for you. <laughs> not, not, not that. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and the address is fifty-three La Valley Lane. Oh, okay. um, yeah. You know, all the size of our front porch Yes. Yeah, we have that's going out this weekend. Cool. Um, we can go to the next slide. So then, the other aspect of our city's work is prioritizing green stormwater infrastructure. Um, and I can share with you a little bit about um our current projects and policies that we are um implementing for this. So one really cool project Eleanor has been working on is a public-private partnership between the Palmer Lou and Champlain Housing Trust, um, Palmer Lou Family Development or whatever. Um, and that is located on Shelburne Road. It's a housing development and it will the stormwater from that um uh, uh, it's a it, community whatever yeah. <laughs> development will be treated using a really cool um strategy that reduces phosphorus um, output called the gravel wetland. And it's also an awesome way that we're using the ARPA money that the city had access to. Is there anything about that? Um, it's, I want to say, you know where Buffalo Wild Wings and like the Market 32 are? Yeah. I think it's in that sort of neck of the woods. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of the very far, very far south end of Berlin. Yeah. So we, um, the work actually started already on that project and they are ahead of schedule, which I feel is rare in the construction <laughs> uh, world. And they, it is going to be done by December, yeah. uh, which is really cool. It's going really quickly. It is, it, what's really cool about it is it's treating 16.2 uh, acres of impervious area, which is going to be the largest clean water project in all of them, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, we're pretty much not paying for it. So almost all of the funding for it is through ARPA funding, which is the um, American Rescue Plan Act funding. And for each two inch storm, it's going to treat over 821,144 gallons. It's a lot of water. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of a lot of water. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're really excited about it. It's, you know, it's new for us. Um, it's 
you know, it's sort of checking a lot of different boxes. We're sort of showing how the, the public and the private sector can sort of come together and actually make things happen. Uh, so yeah, so, and this is in the potash uh, brook watershed. So it also, it's as part of, um, for these impaired streams, we also have what's called flow restoration plans, uh, which are sort of, we try to identify specific actions that will help these, these two brooks and their but their brook as well. But so this project works for potash brook. It helps us meet our phosphorus goals and it, it's sort of um, doing a lot for us. So we're excited. Yep, and then there's two other little projects, not little, projects we're doing up there. One is the Southwind Ledgewood Neighborhood Pond Restoration. So that is a stormwater treatment practice down by Oak Ledge. Um, and the improvements will um, reduce fos the phosphorus being discharged to Blanchard Beach. Um, and then secondly, last, we're, we're working with the planning department to incentivize green infrastructure in the new, um, we have already, um, zoning code in place for the new South End Improvement District, and we're working to make it citywide um, that encourages uh, stormwater to be treated using um, strategies that have um, climate change and ecosystem services co-benefits. So that's something like a rain garden that would provide like pollinator habitat or a tree, a tree cell, we call those the picture up there, which um, can sequester carbon. So um, sort of partnering with other city departments and also um, private partners to uh, incentivize these things as best yeah. as we can. And what sort of what that looks like, it's just like, so as part of sort of city ordinance, any sort of new development, new approved area needs to be fully treated um, from a stormwater perspective. So what we're working to do is sort of um, not force, incentivize, or like you have, any new developers will have to look at green infrastructure first before, and they'll sort of have to show that they can implement green infrastructure before moving on to something else. Um, so that is what we are looking at. So is there a size for, you know, a project where you have that kind of zoning requirement? Um, I think there's a certain amount of square feet um, that you're either adding or that it's a, impervious area of the project exceeds, I think it's 2,500 square feet, then that will trigger um, a zoning review where we'll try to help the applicant um, manage the stormwater runoff from that impervious that they're adding or that's pretty good thing. And is it commercial and Yeah. <laughs> and the, the Southland Lakewood, that, that is a pond that currently exists, it's just, not not really working. Yeah. So it's more of a it's a retrofit of an existing project. Yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so what can you do? I know everyone here is um wants to do the best thing they can for Lake Champlain. We talked about supporting um the wastewater upgrade um when that is needed. Um another awesome option that I think our friend Jill will talk about is blue BTB. This is um a Lake Champlain Sea Grant project that can provide city mon money for projects, um, residential projects. So if you have a stormwater infrastructure project, um, like a rain garden you'd like to build at your house, um, we can help provide funding and Jill can help provide technical support for you to do that. So it's a really cool partnership we have going. We want more people to take advantage of it. Um, yeah, we can adopt a storm drain. I put there's two storm drains in front of my house and one looks horrible and one looks really good. So we can help um, make them all look okay. as good as the one on the left. <laughs> and yeah, you can just keep staying involved. I know you guys um, um, like to attend public meetings and um, make your voices heard. So just keep that up and yeah, we appreciate all of your concern. And yeah, I think that's it from us. Um, you can hand it over to Jill for a minute and then take any questions for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned that. Um, Can you introduce yourself as well? Yeah, my name is Jill Ferguson. I work for um, Lake Champlain Sea Grant, which is uh, an extension program based at um, at UVM in the Bourbon State School. And we partner with the city of Burlington um, and a few other consulting groups um, locally that the city funds us to conduct um, residential site assessments at properties across the city. Um, and that's free for the residents. 
and then we'll um, provide a comprehensive report on recommendations that can be implemented in order to um, reduce the amount of storm water that leaves a property. Um, we're trying to slow it down, send storm water to a stable vegetated area so it can infiltrate into the ground before it goes um, into the streets and combined the system or the, the separate system. So um, we yeah, have done over 60 this this acceptance of year so far between ABM that um, does the acceptance and it can be both an educational opportunity to learn more about stormwater and property and then also by we work with the city um, to approve projects that will then um, residents if they decide to implement those projects will help with design um, and then you can either implement things on your own or hire contractors and then there's up to two thousand dollars of rebate funding per property um, that we have right now from the city that um, you can receive after implementing these projects has anyone here um Received a stormwater assessment. How did it go? Yeah, that's all I used to. I should have asked first. I was laughing because I was thinking you're preaching to the choir. Every single one of you. Why? Did you? I only have four. I got it. Now I'm feeling good about that. Okay, okay. Great. Well, you can feel great. That's so funny. We actually did ours a couple of years ago, and it went really well get a very good uh, assessment with pictures and everything about you know what your what are good areas what are opportunity areas and a lot of resources on where to go so yeah it was great I yeah. highly recommend it yeah your word of mouth is the best way for uh, yeah. I can add that to well. Yeah, and it is, um, it's really, really important to do that on your property because sort of in Ward 6 in particular, you know, the city has done like some projects, but it is some of the soils sort of in the area aren't exactly conducive. Uh, green storm water and things out there, like specifically around the, the right of way. Um, so it's almost the same. It helps us if a lot of people get on the property as well. Because, you know, it might seem like just a small thing, like just a small rain garden, but it's everything. Oh, yeah. And I think that's something we'd love to see out of this engaged MPA is the sort of, um, we do our public outreach on our fourth forum, seven days, whatever, but the face-to-face -face interactions and testimony is really powerful and um, a really strong motivator for neighbors. So um, if I don't know if you would want to do a door knocking campaign, if you want to do a phone tree or something like that, but just encouraging you guys to put out the word. Yeah, we have a proposal. It's yeah. really great. To, that's awesome. Oh, you might want to hear it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Lay it on. We're ready for you. Yeah, so <laughs> I was just going to say, maybe that's a great segue yeah. to what we were going to talk about at the next item in the agenda. This really came out of um, our community. Um, if you weren't able to attend, you might want to go back and take a look at it. Um, Megan and Diane Bear actually came to the meeting with an update on green infrastructure. Eleanor happened to be there talking about the water service line project. And we just saw that this was such a great opportunity where um, we could take uh, individual and collective action to work with this issue of a resource that's essential, which is our water. So um, uh, Diane and Megan had done a lot of work prior to that meeting and we said, let's get together. And we, we met with Eleanor since then to see where it can go from here. And the, we want to do the types of things that you're talking about, raising awareness about the seed grants, um, but also um, educating people going on the tours, there's a bond issue that's going to be coming up in 2025 about the waste treatment um, facilities and why we need upgrades. It's important for the community to understand what 
um, the issues are so we can make informed decisions about that. Yeah, hi, I'm Megan Epler Wood again. So I'm living on South Union Street, and a couple of you have already seen the rain garden. <laughs> um, yeah, she took pictures and was sending it to her friends. So <laughs> <laughs> we're very proud. Thank you. Um, so you've summarized a lot of the you know issues, and it was great to have you here. And I called you before, so that's very nice, Jill, to have you here. Um, so we had thought that an NPA initiative could be a very interesting way to make our NPA a little more proactive as well um, and begin to think about how we can proactively help with this particular situation. Uh, so we, we put together just some ideas. There's hardly anyone here today, so I'm sure we're going to have to do this again, which is no problem, but I'll, I'll put it out there for now. And um, certainly I sent it out in writing to uh, Eleanor and Jill too, so we you know happy to take input. Uh, but we propose a multi-year NPA initiative, which is structured to develop a range of uh, important activities of the kind you were talking about and citizen responses to the uh, runoff issue that we have. And uh, we want to really partner with the water department as well as the Blue BTC grant. I mean, this is an excellent example of how much that cooperation could be beneficial. Right. Uh, so we we talked about what our phases might be. You know, we're still in the early stages. I think, you know, we've had two hour meetings or something like that. But uh, we, we do see that educational programming uh, led by NPA volunteers together, of course, with the things that are already being done might be very fun and interesting for us to do, too. Um, and we could also in winter even do some Zoom workshops, maybe. Uh, we're thinking of you know, rough time frame, something like October of this year to April of next. Uh, we didn't set the number of sessions, but uh, this uh, we did brainstorm on what it could include. And uh, certainly your tours are very important. But in addition, we were thinking of tours of key areas which require attention. I think that's the one thing we're unclear about, at least as citizens now is, you know, yes, we're we're providing assessments, but where are the real trouble spots? That's what we're we're interested in knowing, and maybe we could even visit some of those. Um, and then also model projects. You know, what are the best possibilities? And you showed some of those. And then um, what are the watershed systems that have uh, been affected by recent project buildup? In particular, the Champlain Parkway. Diane wrote an article uh, about how much we lost of green infrastructure as a result of that project. Uh, so she wants to do a walk down Englesby Brook to just demonstrate the challenge that that has created. And then of course, uh, we were very interested also in the Barge Canal, which has a very active community uh, project going already. But the fact is, is that it could be even more if we understood how to protect it better. So so we're, we're thinking big um, for a, you know, a volunteer project. Um, and so we wanted to look into supporting more the, the Blue BTV project and helping to identify and work with neighbors. And, and I, you know, I just talked to a few already, but you can imagine how much more we could do, uh, because I, I imagine that if folks knew that there was a budget for at least helping them to, you know, absorb some of their costs, uh, I don't think that's, I don't find that we didn't even know that and we created a rain garden. So, so, um, so it's and certainly the contractors too. our contractor, which is a well-known one, didn't mention it to mm -hmm. us. So, so it's good that we found it. Um, so we wanted to look at how to work on that. And then also uh, we wanted to look at the commercial projects. Now you've really raised some interesting points tonight that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, so uh, we still want to be more informed. I would say uh, we have, we're going to go to the Memorial Auditorium meeting next week. Uh, all of us have found that a lot of the uh, opportunity to give input on projects in the city was just dropped uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, I sat in at the NPA during the time that it was presented what was going to happen in a pre-development agreement uh, in which uh, they absolutely just dropped all the previous input that had been you know, provided. And so now we have a new opportunity to give, you know, learn what they're going to do and give input on this topic. Uh, but we have more to learn, certainly by way of what you're looking at as well. Uh, so that's exciting. But, you know, commercial projects we're interested in as well. And then we talked a little bit, all, all of us now, on the neighborhood code. And what uh, that's why I asked about the size of the infrastructure and whether it was residential or not, because I'm curious 
how much that neighborhood code is going to affect our efforts to improve our uh, runoff. And so what I suggested to Jill, which sounds exciting, is, is that there could be uh, a NPA role in helping to foster a student project uh, that would look at the, you know, what kind of a projection using GIS would we see the impacts could be from the neighborhood code, depending on how much is built up over time. So she said she could talk to us more about that in a follow-up meeting. And then um, finally, we just wanted to look at the, as I said, the major larger catchment sites. And of course, that includes Callahan Park, which hasn't come up. And so we were thinking, wow, that's such a great opportunity for a community project because it's such a popular park. And, you know, there could be ways, to, which I know you would love, uh, where we have more people like actually helping with the actual design and getting everyone all involved in Callahan Park because it's a beloved park and probably could be done in a beautiful way. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the barge canal. We really want to involve, you know, involve that couple that has uh, the assignments. Uh, uh, and they have really done an amazing job on that already. And so I didn't mention, but we want to invite, involve three wards. So uh, we want to involve, involve ward five, six, and eight. And I think eight has already said they're interested. Yeah. Uh, and But we haven't presented yet to ward five. So we still have to do that. So that's roughly what we wanted input on. I think it's kind of a small group tonight, but uh, it's where we're starting and we're very happy for any input you might have tonight. And the other thing I want to mention is that we definitely want input from the group on what the priority should be. And we're really looking for other people who want to work with us on this because we think it's a great opportunity for people to get involved at whatever level they're interested, you know, whether you want to do something in your own, on your own street, on your own property, um, or something more at the community level, um, there's a lot of opportunity. Thank you. Anything else we want to add on this topic? Actually, I wanted to ask as well, where would we go if we, being the only person here who hasn't gotten this done, I would love to do that. Where would I go? So, uh, sign up. Um, we have a sign up. Link from the city of Burlington website, and I don't know you can sign up. You can look your code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and oh, I just wanted to say, I got the, um, uh, when you come to the TV, because I learned about it at the May and yeah. I've not had a chance to do like an implementation yet because I was distracted by other stuff. But what a great process. Um, we did not gold star. We actually got, boy, these are going to be hard problems to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so well, much. Oh, it's just great. Actually, we could go back to the previous uh, section. Yeah, if you had any questions, had questions about the slide. Okay. Sure. Uh, do we have time? Uh, yeah. we, we have a yeah. few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I have three questions. So we'll make it, make it fast. <laughs> oh, three minutes. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, um, I've always been interested in uh, too much salt being put on the uh, sidewalks, mm -hmm. particularly, particularly flat sidewalks where there's no slopes. You know, I think there's too much. And you didn't mention fluoride except maybe once. Uh, let, let me give you all three and then you can pick and choose depending on how much time you have. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's uh, uh, adopt a drain. I would like to adopt at least one drain yeah. because I've already been cleaning drains. And, and if you have little plaques or something to like, you know, adopt a road, you know, the mm -hmm. signs, maybe adopt a, a drain might be a good thing. And then the third thing is, uh, I've been in contact with, uh, and he actually was at an NTA meeting a few weeks ago. The fellow, um, it's actually in Ward 8, uh, two doors down, three doors down from the Edmonds. Who has this spring water uh, bubbling up from his property and going into the street, causing no problem. And there have been other springs on South Union also, on the east side of the South Union. And uh, so I was just wondering about the, the policy on uh, what about uh, you know feeding uh, uh, whose responsibility is feeding these springs into the into the uh, city water system. So those are my three. I think the first two was. <laughs> Um, in terms, yeah, so the call actually at UVM this, is, this week, yes, around, uh, we came together with UVM, City Burlington, South Burlington, 
Williston. Williston. Yeah. Um, to sort of share knowledge about how to reduce uh, salt as we salt roads. Um, I think no policy sort of outcome has come from that. And so. What? Yeah, and no, and so yeah, as part of uh, roads and sidewalks. Um, because it, in Burlington specifically, there's there's no like ordinance or anything saying that we have to salt the sidewalks. It's just sort of something that we have always done. And so now I think it's more about like a, a politically difficult uh, mm -hmm. to to stop salting the sidewalks. And then what if you have someone fall or any, I think, you know, people who are environmentally conscious don't really want to salt the sidewalks, but mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know about that. So there's definitely, I think we might, we might do some, some education about that, especially as we, you know, just not to be all or none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But yeah, so some, you know, we can come back yet again. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and talk about, um, and, you know, you can add like sort of solutions to the to the shock like that. You were there. <laughs> There's like, there are lots of different technologies to at least reduce the amount of salt and um, having only one grain of salt for every three inches in some yeah. uh, methods. So there's, yeah, my uh, our program is definitely working on um, addressing those, those issues, but it's a, it's a big one yeah. <laughs> that we're seeing. It's going to keep increasing because, yeah, salty streams. Are big issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then from the docks drain, it is, it's actually a national program. And, um, for the, if, I think I just think it's a docudrain.org, but it just if you Google or Dr. Drain, but <laughs> you can go and it'll tell you um it'll like sort of already be in, in Burlington and it'll you can easily see all of the drains that have not been adopted. And when you adopt your drain, you can name it, which we can We've seen some cool some cool names uh, for sure. You um drains that are in busy streets uh, aren't allowed to be adopted because we don't want to have people go out in the street and get them yeah. <laughs> so, so you can't adopt all of the adopt all of the drains, but there there are many available. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think we called it we call that logo the drain defenders and we, we send like emails before I think the last biggest storm that we had to send an email to them. All the adopted drain people. Like, Pick up your arms. Just <laughs> pick your drains. Uh, so yeah, I so definitely, definitely recommend doing that. And then, um, as a sort of an outreach uh, project um, with the Winooski Resource Conservation District, we're also looking at promoting adopted drain. And I think one of the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to do like a little some drain stenciling, like a little art, temporary art thing mm -hmm. around. The drains to you know, to showcase adopt. <laughs> uh, we do want more people to do it. And the about the yeah, spring. I can speak a little to that. Um, we currently like a spring is considered groundwater, um, and we currently don't have a city policy regarding groundwater. We do have a policy around sidewalk wetting. So in the winter, you're not permitted to discharge water onto the sidewalk because it might freeze. Um, and I think we're starting to think about um, enforcement for that and what that might look like. Would we um, use blue money to like create an infiltration strategy or, or what would our strategy be? So it's on our mind. We we definitely know about it on South Union, but also other places in the city. And yeah, we are looking at a groundwater policy. Yeah. Not at the top, top of the part. <laughs> These things that we talked about are higher up there. Yep. But in regards to that specific issue, we are we've been working with um, that the land those landowners about yeah. Yeah. yeah about trying to figure out solutions. They're really tough saying I think we have a solution, they're working on it, so oh, yeah. that's yeah, and then we're working on it. Right now right at yeah. the school and mm -hmm. the school, right? Right, yeah. the area. I've seen those red flags out in that particular spot as well. So I was excited to see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fingers crossed, we can figure it out. Thank you so much for being here. Just one question. How far back do your records go for Adopt the Drain? Because I signed up for that 20 years ago. Well, <laughs> keep, did you receive yeah. an email? I have not, never received an email. 
Well, are you still taking care of your dream? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the name of your dream? I never be. I don't think I ever be. Keep up the good work and feel free to give it. A I would go on adopt a dream, and if the dream that you adopted, like you, you could find it, and it'll tell you whether or not it's free. If it's if someone else is taking your dream, we. We will fix yeah. the situation. It's right out in front of the Grove Street Co-op. Yeah. But, but last summer they put a drain right in front of my house, so I'd rather transfer it from my house. You, you, you can do that. We can help you with that. On the other side of the street. Yeah. That could be an awesome goal for your um, list of uh, plans is make sure every drain at Fort Six is adopted. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe we should have a prize for whatever work gets to yeah. 100% first. It's yeah, or use up all the blue money. Yeah. Yeah. The, the drain in front of my house is available. I plan to adopt it, but I was a little intimidated by having to give the drain a name right away. I'm like, oh, I need to like, think about this. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the drain, drain face might already be taken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we allowed you to look at Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cody. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate Thanks for having us. Uh, okay, I think we can move our, to our last uh, item on the agenda, which is NPA business. Uh, and we'll pass it around to these agenda items, but one point I'll just raise is a uh, request for input about this year's schedule and meeting topics. Uh, it will also have been here. Uh, and uh, we, we, this is our newsletter. We uh, mention this every time during our meetings, but we do have a link for a Google form, and we would love to have anybody here who has already weighed in, weigh in on future topics, uh, particularly long range work, things we want to talk about uh, over multiple meetings or invite people uh, to come in months ahead. Uh, we'd love your help in identifying agenda items. Uh, so we'll do that again when we send around our agenda for next week, for next month's event. Uh, but uh, yeah, please join us. Uh, Next item is uh, for our October meeting date, I believe. Dale, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it falls for Rosh Hashanah, and we're looking at changing it. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, also, do again. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we are, I think, uh, we take a look at the calendar. Do we have a specific date we're looking to move it to? Is the week following? Well, one thing that we had talked about talk, talk on the steering committee about doing a combined meeting Board eight, and we had talked specifically about the possibility of doing that, um, doing an information session on the ballot item that's going to be on the ballot. The oversight ballot initiative. We wanted to have um, have that be one of our topics, and because it's a citywide issue, we thought. It, uh, would make sense to combine with the work for you. Right. And so given that our meeting night conflicted with Rosh Hashanah, we thought we might use the Ward 8 meeting night so that we are not stressing CCTV and so we are not stressing CETA with having to, to support multiple meetings when they've already got scheduled. So, we wanted to be here tonight, couldn't be here, um, but would follow up. So we think that they would do that. Four. Four Thursday of the month, so that puts it much closer to the date of the election. One slight downside there is if people are voting early with a mail in doubt, they may have already voted, but it is still in October with the election being in November. So and if people it might be the best that we can do and it might be the best solution. And I was just gonna say if people know that we're having that meeting, they may hold off. You know, if we let people know ahead of time that we're going to have have that session, they may hold off sending in their bell. Not that we want to call them to hold. I don't think. So, any any thoughts or feedback on 
what is the date exactly of that report? Oh, you asked the tough questions. Race to pull the calendar. Everybody's got to pull up their calendar, actually. So it's the fourth Thursday, you say? No, yeah, so that would be the 24th. Uh, that would be the 31st, actually. No, no I'm sorry, 24th. 24th. Halloween in the back of the So it's 24th, Bob. Okay, the third Wednesday of each month is always open. The third Wednesday. Okay. It's always open for the NPA. There's no NPA set on the third Wednesday. So October 16th is an option. That would be October 16th. We would need to move for it. So we could, we could propose that to Ward 8. Where would be that if it more than Meantime, or do you want to move on? So we can, we can talk about that. Okay. Um, so maybe so as the next step there, I think the steering committee will talk with the Ward 8 steering committee and we'll do our best to balance um, shipping dates, make sure folks are able to attend, and also as much as possible before you go. Uh, anything else that we want to cover on that particular point? Um, so I just want to, I want to be clear, um, if we are going to, that we are not going to have a meeting on our regular October meeting date, which is Russia shine. That looks good. Okay. Be, you can vote on that or not, but we could. <laughs> I think we can just decide that. Yeah, we're right. Hearing no opposition. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and then we we'll follow up with Ward 8, considering the third Wednesday, for Ward 8's typical meeting of the fourth Thursday. Right. Either one of which would be supportable mm -hmm. by our support team. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to talk about. I was say, if we do that, we will send out a separate newsletter and a one. So yes. Just announcing the big change for everyone. Yeah. And then the other thing that we wanted to talk about was meeting location and cost. So Champlain College last year allowed us to use space um, at no charge, which was very generous. This year, um, Nick said he is um, obliged to tell us that they typically charge for these rooms. The charge is typically $120 for the block of time. Um, there is some room, I think, some wiggle room in that price. Um, and we could also talk about meeting in a different place. One thing that's kind of funny that we realized is that we are not actually within Ward 6 when we meet here. <laughs> so I don't know how much that matters, but it is kind of worth noting. Um, I think there are meeting spaces that we could use elsewhere in the city. I think this is probably more convenient to work six than the other spaces which are more likely to be downtown but it's just something to toss out see if anybody like greg has any ideas about <laughs> yeah well um edmonds used to be in ward six but it's now in ward eight so we actually vote the council had to pass a special mm -hmm. whatever uh, to allow us to what? Just like oh, yeah. oh, like, yeah, allow us to uh, allow us to actually have our polling place outside of our work. So it's not unprecedented to have continue to be here if there's money in the budget or it can be negotiated then. Uh, Anita, you want to give it another shot and see if we can? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> if you can unmute. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll try it again. I finally have a picture. <laughs> that took a while. Um, yeah, by comparison, um, Ward 5, I believe, meets at BED, and that's free. And I think it's Ward 1 that meets at the Quaker space, and that's twenty two fifty an hour. Um, I think it's unconscionable to use that much of our budget as we'd have to pay for Champlain. And as, as there isn't any reason really to, to have to be in the ward. We could use places like City Market down to the South City Market. They have a free community room. Um, we could also use BED, which would also be free, evidently. So I would recommend that we look at those kind of spaces. We can use our money for something better. Okay. 
Yeah, if we do the math, I assume we attend meetings a year, you know, something that's four hundred dollars. Uh, it's pretty significant. So uh, I think we can uh, we welcome any additional feedback on that. I mean, at the very least, we can take some action from the steering committee to look at alternative venues and look at the costs uh, from that. And I don't think they'll do that in advance by October, but probably, seeing that we're going to move it anyway to the date. Uh, and we can also look at the location too, the program is providing it with order. Uh, so that's probably a good opportunity for us to. Any other thoughts or feedback or uh, comments on the uh, new location? Okay, anything else before we wrap up the evening? Yeah. Oh, Nita, you're back. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I, I just want to say one, one more thing. This may be sound petty, but the reason I'm not in person is because I drove around for 25 minutes and couldn't find a parking space. Yeah. <laughs> Maple Street is absolutely parked up top to bottom. <laughs> and City Market has a big parking lot. <laughs> and, and, and so does BED, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so people should talk to Nick Anderson, who was here earlier about parking, because there's actually parking on Summit Street. There's a parking lot across on the UVM side of Summit Street. There's a big parking lot there. Um, I, I don't know, can Anita hear you saying that if you're not speaking into a mic? Oh, I'm talking to that one. Just making sure. I was just making sure because okay. you've trained the rest of us so well. Yeah. Um, there was a special event tonight. That's why uh, I don't know about the parking lot you were talking about, but uh, the other parking lots, uh, I noticed there were signs. Um, th they were full anyway, but uh, that's why it was especially a problem tonight. Okay. Every yes. location has advantages and disadvantages. Right. Like right. the friends meeting house, they've got lots of parking, but it's kind of isolated. DPW has all the parking in the world, but they're way down there. They're mm -hmm. not within walking distance of anybody. And mm -hmm. so they yeah. all have. Yeah, good point. Well, thank you, Wayne. It's a good uh, good action for us to take to look at our options and how we're going to discuss them. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for attending in person and also virtually. I think we can adjourn for the evening. Kind of look forward to the